we now have much higher possibility space than anyone in human history. Possibility is destabilizing and people are uncomfortable with that. We're really building the plane in mid-air while we are falling through the sky. Having an open aperture, you're going to see more. Pessimism is a kind of death. It's a kind of, let's not change things, let's not try new things, let's just hold what we have and die. <laughs> right? There's always more to do. Yeah. There's always more to do. By putting together different types of minds, that's where the magic happens. Let me get my friend who might be on the other side of the planet and see what he thinks about this. The rate of collision is so much higher. Focus on what you want to see more of, right? Focus on the good stuff. Well, hello, everybody. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with another Infinite Loops. And I got to tell you, I have been looking forward to this one for a long time. My favorite, friendly, ambitious nerd, Visa, is back. Visa, so good to see hey. you. Hey, Jim. I'm so glad to be back. Thank you for having me. I just love everything you do, man. I, I love what you write. I love your your books. Uh, congratulations on being mm -hmm. a dad. We were chatting about that a little bit before we started to record. Mm -hmm. So, so let's just let's go in there. It, mm -hmm. There's a, there's a before times, before yeah. children, and an after children. How's right. it? How's it going? How's it going for you? Yeah, uh, I'm lo so. First of all, I'm loving it. Like, uh, you know, I, I so I, I did worry because I've I've read some of the worst things that people have had to say over the years, right? So I did worry. Oh, what if I don't feel love for my child? Or what if I feel overwhelmed? Or what if I feel? Um, I haven't had to worry about that so much. I think I'm quite blessed. Like we are quite blessed. We we seem to have a really adorable, easy baby. Like he 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 cries, but you know, I've I've heard other people deal with much worse. Uh, you know, there are moments of joy like. I was giving him a bath and my wife was like playing peekaboo with him from behind my back. And when he starts laughing, it's just, I feel my whole, it's like, oh, everything in my life up until that point suddenly felt worth it. Like every, you know, every heartbreak and grief and betrayal and upset, like all of that, like if there were like, if previously they felt like, op like scars or like open wounds or whatever, like just, you know, like things that hurt they suddenly all like faded substantially. Like, oh, all of that is not important. I have this joy in front of me. And that's been amazing. Um, but it is also, you know, it's it's chaotic and relentless. And so uh, I can't remember who was it who said something like, um, just babies will, like, you know how, um, I think some some software companies, they have these like uh, to to prepare for, like malicious attacks or something like just to, to have their their code architecture do well they actually have somebody in house deliberately mess with things on purpose just so that you know they, they call them like chaos monkeys or something like that and like a child is a chaos monkey like you, you whatever plans you have whatever you might not even so i didn't even think of myself as a person with plans and structure until i had a child and i realized oh i was counting on not being interrupted for 30 minutes and I can no longer count on that exactly, uh, which is a challenge, but an interesting challenge, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, I love it. I, I'm i so thrilled to be a dad. I fall in love with my wife all over again, watching her care for my son. And, uh, you know, I, I re-inhabit the world from a whole fresh perspective, right? Just thinking of how, what am I modeling for him, right? Or what am I going to teach him? Or what am I going to show him? Or like, you know... Um, things just feel so much more um, concrete. Like a lot of things that used to feel abstract, right? Like, uh, like if I were ever uncertain about how something is relevant to me, now a lot of it comes through like, well, you know, does this help me put food on the table for my kid? Or does this help me, you know, become more of the dad that I want to be, right? And and stuff like that. So it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, context is... is uh very different after having children. I, I had uh, the same experience um, with my kids. I wasn't terribly worried about loving them. Um, and when my first child, Patrick, came out, like instant, literally instant, the, the, I, I could just feel my body flooding with those wonderful chemicals. And mm. then when, when we were anticipating our first grandchild, uh, Pierce, who's a Patrick's son. 
Mm-hmm. I spoke with my wife about it and I said, do you think we're going to have that same instant love for a grandchild that we had mm-hmm. for our children? Right. And we chatted about it. And then when he was born and they brought him out, man, exactly the Basically. same. Yeah. And, and, and the context it gives is just so wonderful. Right. Yeah. So even so when I first had my son, um, I remember feeling, you know, for the first time, I really felt viscerally like, oh, my grandparents had to take care of my parents and their grandparents, their parents had to take care of them. And like some, I mean, they might not have done it perfectly, but all the way back to, to went all the way, right? It's like somebody had to feed and, and care for the child one way or another. And that was, so that was a trip, right? Just feeling this sense of continuity and connection to the past. And also, recently, I brought my kid over to my parents' place for, I think, my mom's birthday. And I got to see my dad hold my son. And I could see my dad getting emotional looking at his grandson. And I'm just, I'm watching that. I'm getting emotional too. Like, you know, this this is it. This is what life is about. Life is what, what it's for, right? It's that, that, that continuity. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just wonderful. You know, uh, I, I often say that when, when you're feeling down or you're feeling blue, remember, you are the result of millions of years of success. That's Basically, true, yeah. it, it, and, and what your point is well taken by me. I had the same kind of thought process, just thinking, oh my God, like, think of all of the other generations that had to succeed in caring for loving, uh, hopefully, loving mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and and bringing that child into the world to the point where they could be on their own i i i just think it's a, an amazing uh uh way to look at the world because it really does open your eyes uh well congratulations i and i'm delighted for you you know now i've got a bone to pick with you which is mm-hmm. how the hell did you get david deutsch onto a podcast you know that I love this guy, and I recommend his book to everybody. And then uh-huh. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready to talk to you. <laughs> it's just the podcast. I'm like, oh my god, it was great, right. by the way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I do. That was that was actually one of my first few recorded conversations with somebody else. And, I, and there is actually one issue with it, which is that I'm so excited to try and make sure that he has a good time that I keep saying, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. Like, I'm just trying to <laughs> affirm him. And I, I should have edited that out, but I did it in any. But um, so that's one of those, like, strange, magical flukes where I didn't reach out to him. It's like we had a mutual friend who... And she is, like, his... Like um, so her name is Luli, and David is her family friend from when she was very young. So like she and David go way back. She's like a she's almost like a like a surrogate daughter ish to him maybe, and it just so happened. I think this was early in the pandemic. I guess I I don't know if so. Like I don't think he had like a media strategy planned at that point in time. I wasn't. It was very random, almost like um. Just yeah, it was it was super random. I don't think I would have gotten him by like doing a media outreach kind of thing. And like uh, I remember at the end of our chat, um, he was so gracious, and I said, "Hey, if there's anything that I can share with you based on our chat, like shall I email it to you?" And he said the most gracious thing. He said, "Um, I I most likely won't get around to reading it, but I shall be very eternally grateful that you sent it or that you thought <laughs> to send it." And I was like, "Oh, that's lovely." Like, <laughs> yeah, and like um. He's a wonderful guy. He's so thoughtful and curious, and uh, and you know, I, f- I feel that you know, and so b- in preparing for my chat with him, I went to watch a bunch of his interviews, and I felt like everybody that he talks to, or I mean, I don't know if I'm biased, but um, it felt like all the videos. If you look up David Deutsch on YouTube, it's always an interviewer interviewing him, being like, "Esteemed sir, please regale us with." you know, your talking points. And I was like, I wanna I wanna do something different, like for him as well, right? I wanna I wanna be just a guy chatting with him. And I asked him like, what what was it like when you were a kid? When did you remember first conceiving of infinity? Or like, you know, I was, I wanted to approach it on that level. And so if you see the comments in my videos, there's like this interesting spread where some people say, Wow, you've asked questions that nobody else has asked before. And some people are like, oh the interviewer talks way too much about himself. And I I I didn't conceive of it as an interview. I really thought of it as a chat. 
and it, I, I, for me, my metric of success was I wanted to make sure that David had a great time, and I think he did. And I'm, of course, he, he might have just been being polite, <laughs> but I think he did. And uh, I think I think that's an interesting point of like departure for some people. Like uh, elsewhere, people have talked about how like all a lot of podcasts start to sound the same because it's the same into the same like people promoting their books going on the same dozen or so famous podcasts and they all ask the same questions and i'm like yeah how, how, what what could we talk about that would be different so i i can try and introduce you but i'm guessing he wouldn't get my email if, if i sent it to him but <laughs> yeah <laughs> actually that's what i loved about it as you know the format of this podcast tries to aim for that kind of vibe right mm. uh because i agree with you like the but, world w- w- yeah the world that's a similar need, you know <laughs> i yeah i know we are and I, uh, that's why i always look forward to reading your stuff and and chatting with you uh but the world doesn't need another podcast with the same format and you know there are plenty that are so much better at that than mm. i could ever ever be and yeah. so it's just like, from my point of view, I loved it for all mm-hmm. of the reasons right. that that you're you're pointing out. So what what do you what do you, what did you think? What do you think about uh, the beginning of Infinity? Uh, I thought it and was great. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And what, what what like? Give me your your biggest takeaways and and what changed in your own mind after reading right. it because it really profoundly affected me. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I've had some exposure to like just techno optimism in gen- like scientific optimism in general in the abstract. So it's not like the ideas in it were like alien to me and like shocking. But I deeply admire so I did I did do a Twitter thread reading the the book, which which is what um got Luli to introduce us. But uh yeah, uh I was even in the first chapter. I was like astounded at how masterfully David um, is aware of all of the possible wrong turns that can be taken in trying to understand something. And like he lays it out and he lays out the objection and then he, he very fluidly, it's like a, he's like a judo karate master, you know, kind of like deftly slicing through things. And then I remember in, when I was reading his book, I underlined certain bits where I'm like, how can he say that? He's saying that so confidently. Like, if I were to try... So I think at some point he says something, he says some things like, uh, oh, the only way that we know anything is through conjecture and criticism. And I'm like, that's a very bold claim. Like, how do you... And then I think about it, and I think about it, and I'm like, it's right. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's so elegant and compressed and condensed. There's this passage at some point where he talks about, um, you know, once upon a time, a lot of parts of the earth that we currently inhabit were once uninhabitable. And we, you know, with inhuman ingenuity and science and figuring stuff out, made life support systems in the form of heating and clothing and all of whatever to allow us to inhabit certain spaces. And then he just casually drops things like, you know, we don't yet have a nuclear reactor. Like, it's just the way he navigates things. It's so, um, it's the confidence that's based on having gone through all the possibilities like he he knows all of the areas in his idea maze very very well, and it's it's such a pleasure right to inhabit that space and to know that, um, you know so so that when he is optimistic, it's not like a blind faith of like oh you know surely things will get better. He's like no oh, if if you look at the numbers if you look at the the history of the thing and you see what's possible and what's not and so on and so forth, and yeah it really um reinvigorated me to want to be more ambitious. I think that's my main, the thing that I got away from it. Like, I'm sure if I reread it, so it's been a while since I last read it. I'm sure if I reread it now, I will be like, oh, wait, this this thing should get more attention. This thing should get more, uh, so on and so on. But really, he, he captures the pleasure of effective thinking. And not, so like, not just thinking in like this, you know, ruminating on philosophical ideas for the pleasure of that, which is fine also, you know, but like he has this kind of um, direction, like there's a vector to it, right? Like, like um, you know, human, advancing human capability, right? In this, in, and, and not in this overwrought, like we're trying to do something different, but just we've already been doing it, you know? And like uh, another one of my favorite risks from him is the idea of like, um, 
how so I've 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 recorded this so many times. I've kind of remixed it into my own language, so I don't know where his idea starts and mine begins. But it's like the idea that you know, historically, most human creativity was deployed in suppressing human creativity because change is a natural constant. Like everything's always in flux all the time, and that makes people uncomfortable. And so, people you. So and another phrase I I got remixing that was if you ever think someone isn't creative just look at the excuses because it it takes you know like like oh I can't do this because of that I can't do this because of that like you, you keep having to rearrange matter or rearrange concepts or rearrange something to explain why you can't do something and you could just as much deploy that same skill set to explain why something might be possible but. You know, possibility is destabilizing, and people are uncomfortable with that. And so, for most of human history, and, and you know, David uh, um, explains this more substantially, with more substantiated uh, evidence and stuff. But like, my one I remember was like, uh, so this idea of like anti mimetic idea, something like that. It's like the sense that a, a lot of intellectual and creative energy was deployed to try and throttle change down, so that people could have more stable environments. There's like there's some good to it. But, um, you know, once you see that, you realize that, like, oh, man, now that, now that you asked me about this, I think about it more, I realize this must have, like, that understanding, like, this cascaded through my, my own entire, like, idea lattice of all the other things that I care about, which is, like, you know, so some of the questions people ask are, like, why do we not already live in a much better world, right? Like, in terms of, like, like why do we not have better education systems? Why do we not have better X, Y, Z? And it's usually that that you know there is a lot of resistance to change, and like we have to really understand the truth of it in order to actually make a difference. And I feel like I'm rambling. <laughs> this this yeah. you know this everything everything around that is just so intoxicating to me. It's so, it's so exciting. It's like once you understand, then you can. You know, you understand that people are uncomfortable with change. That means if you want to change things, you have to kind of demonstrate how the change is going to be um, survivable and manageable. Right? Uh, I know there's an Andy Grove quote where he says something like, uh, only if you've been through the crucible of change can you have any kind of like hope for the future. Because if you haven't, then the future is scary and destabilizing and you'll do everything you can to resist it. And uh, yeah, and I'm also thinking about things like, you know, when we came up with... Um, the car, we had to call it the horseless carriage so that people who were familiar with horse-drawn carriages were like, oh, it's like this, but that. You know, it's like, so it's, there's, there's a lot to get into about like how to think about change and creativity and even, so even I think, so, um, you know, when I talk about Friendly Ambitious Nerd, like, I, I think David's an excellent example, especially like Ambitious Nerd I mean, he's also really friendly. Like he doesn't he doesn't write so much about that in his book itself. Like he's fixated on going deep into the nerd stuff ambitiously, right? And he's also really friendly, but that's not a part of his book. But um, you know, uh, curiosity. Uh, so I, I define a nerd as someone who's driven by their curiosity, and the more of your behavior is determined by your curiosity, the bigger of a nerd you are. It's a very useful definition. And a sufficiently advanced nerd is dangerous to people it's perceived as dangerous on multiple dimensions right like if you ask too many questions you figure out how to make bombs and tnt and split the atom and that's now you're a you're a state asset of like national security weapon blah 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 and also for like tnt also makes fertilizer nuclear bombs also makes power and even if you set aside that knowledge is power dimension even in, in like the social realm like a person who's observant and curious and like you can notice it's it's funny like and I, I, I noticed this even on Twitter itself. Like, people will say things that are incredibly revealing about what their experiences must have been. And so you can sometimes scroll through the timeline and see, huh, this person feels very strongly about this issue. They must have had some past experience that influenced their perception. And then, you know, so maybe they are, like, arguing about something to do with gender, right? And then, you know, hmm. Then you do a from their username search, which can be done, and you put, uh, from username divorce and then you find you see that oh their parents got divorced when they were young and it's it's like the information is all there but what do I do with it you know it's like it, it would be weird and awkward and rude to like bring it up in conversation when you can see that they wrote about it once but they were not expecting someone to bring it up in the next exchange and so like 
so again, that's why I write friendly ambitious nerd because the friendly part is about being socially savvy enough to know not to, <laughs> you know, like bring up, hey, so how about your parents divorce, huh? Like, but like a, a a nerd who is sufficiently curious and seeks out all the information that's available to them will arrive at an understanding that is a violation, basically. Right? And even in locally in Singapore, like um, I remember there was a minister who was giving a speech somewhere saying. Like, where are all our creative uh, geniuses? You know, where are, like, our Roald Dahls and Enid Blytons and, like, J.K. Rowling's or whatever? And I was like, well, you know, if you want people to be creative, they have to be asking questions and they have to be making mistakes. And, they like, you have to have an environment where that's possible. And it's, it's like, this very funny an, an analogy I'm familiar with is, like, um, oh, it's when the, the arsonist is also the firefighter. Like, you set a building on fire and then come to put it out. And it's like, well, you caused the very problem that you're trying to solve. And it's like, I mean, we have this in so many dimensions in Singapore. I've talked about this for hours. Like an, another quick one is like, we introduced this thing decades ago. I, I don't think it's, it's now probably in a different form, but it used to call it uh, like the singles development unit or something. Like trying to get people to date more. And the idea was that, oh, they're very busy and something and they need like a, a, a government initiative to encourage people it didn't really work out well and like the thing is, the, the, the idea is like they kept trying to introduce new things to solve the problem of like people being overly stressed when the actual solution would actually be closer to give people more freedom and space to do whatever they want and then they'll naturally be more free to do those things and um it, it all rhymes somehow. I, I haven't figured out how to say it in a way that's like, oh, all the f- several different things that I've just said, they are all kind of the same thing. Like, it's the same thing why people are not more creative, why people are not more curious, why people are not more flirty. It's it's kind of connected, right? Like, fl- flirtiness is a kind of creative curiosity about interpersonal relationships, right? And yeah, <laughs> that can go on forever, but let me know what you think. I I agree completely. And and I'm just reminded of the idea that really we are emotional creatures, we humans. Mm-hmm. And and I think that the governing emotion is fear. Yes. And when when you make decisions from a fearful place, you start becoming a, a stronger adherent to the precautionary principle, which David talks about a lot. Yeah. And and if that is allowed to go too far you get to stasis, which is death, in my opinion. Yeah. And and movement is life. And mm. if if you're looking at friendly, ambitious nerds, curiosity, that's right. movement. That's all movement. And yeah. and so you're you're always trying to like your example of Singapore. The, you know, the ideal balance is very very difficult to find, right? Because the thing that I think is I'm I'm very optimistic about the future of humanity. I am not at all ignorant of the problems that we will face. And right. and the the idea is that it pessimists sound smart, right? It's pretty e- and it's also easy. It's very easy to look at something a proposal or whatever and just shit all over it, right? Like this won't work, this won't work, this won't work, this won't work. It takes creativity and a lot courage. of thought to encourage. Exactly, yeah. you know, great great artists are courageous, right? Yeah. And cool. the the way I look uh, at the idea is that part of the you know the inter uh, uh, weaving of all of our all of humanity, real really, and the human colossus is that we now can have a greater coalition. And by that, I mean, we know each other now and we, we vibe now. And the idea that I would have never met you in the previous world, I, I, right. And, and so my idea is that we can now coalesce with the, with the creative side in a way that we really couldn't have done in the past, yeah. which, which yeah. I find remarkable and encouraging i always yeah so in my second edition of fan which which i'm working on now i i think even in my first one i, I mentioned it somewhere but I, I i'm making a stronger point of it I, like as a kind of um you know uh, so the, the so the idea is that we honor our predecessors 
by fulfilling their dreams. Like we do what they dreamt of but couldn't accomplish. And one of my favorite stories is uh, there's a letter from Marshall McLuhan to Ezra Pound in 1948. And he's, it's, it's so beautiful and sad. He's like dreaming of coalescing, right? He's like saying, you know, we have a few friends here. I have a few friends there uh, who are smart, thoughtful people. I just want to bring a dozen great minds together. You know, it might have to be in a university. It might have to be, I'm not sure precisely how, but like, I'm always thinking about this. I'm always thinking, how do we get a dozen people together to basically imagine the future into existence? And I read that and I want to cry because I'm like, they didn't have the internet. You know, they didn't have Twitter. They couldn't, do what we can do so trivially, right? And so I, I feel like those of us who feel like we are nerds, we owe it to our predecessors to achieve their dreams. Just just as like we're talking about parenting and so these are like spiritual parents, right? Or creative parents. Like when we read the books and we, you know, you read something from Montaigne or Emerson and you're like, I, I feel this. This is my guy. And you're like, well, Emerson and Montaigne did not have Twitter, right? <laughs> and so I, I just feel like... um. And, and at the same time, I see so many people uh, on, who's online particularly, but everywhere really, who feel like, oh, well, there's nothing much to do anymore. I don't really feel a sense of purpose. I'm kind of bored. I'm kind of depressed. And I'm like, we, we can assemble you know, the greatest coalition of all time. Not even because we are superior people to our predecessors. We just have the technology, right? We, we have access to tools that allow us to do what our predecessors could not. So I'm, yeah, I'm very passionate about this. Yeah, and and you've it, that feeds into your idea of possibility space, right? We now have much higher possibility space than anyone in human history. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I I even so like if you read uh, Isaacson's uh, biography of Da Vinci, he he lists out a Da Vinci to do list, and it's like ask Mister X about how to draw um, a circumference of something. Ask someone else about how something else. He's, it's basically a list of things that we can Google in 15 minutes. Like, And it took him, I think, month, like a year of his life just to answer the questions that he had, right? Like, Because he has to go and talk to this guy and that guy has to go and check the library somewhere else. And it's just such an involved process. Whereas now, like, Again, I, I'm such, I'm still such a Twitter fanboy because you can have a conversation with someone and then you can you can do the equivalent of, hey, let me get my friend who might be on the other side of the planet and see what he thinks about this. And then those two people might have an exchange and they'll be like, huh, maybe we should start a company or maybe we should, you know, do something together. And like, you can just, the, the rate of collision is so much higher that, and I mean, so it's interesting because... For people who are like high agency, have a strong sense of self, understand culture, understand media, understand how to read and, and not get like messed up by chaos. Uh, for those people, which I consider our people, like we're going to flourish. We're going to do really, really well. But at the same time, I, I do have this parallel concern. Like, uh, and I, I think this is like one of the dominant, like modern anxieties of our time which is that oh the smartphone is driving us crazy because this again it's, it's the same thing it's like possibility space is getting so heated up people don't know what to do with their lives they're like should i take this job but what if ai changes everything next year or what if you know this and what if that and um, um so you, you asked to talk about possibilities yes it's still relevant right um i describe this as the problem of wretchedness wretched as in like you know, we used to say, and we don't really use, there's some words we don't use very much anymore. We don't use virtue very much anymore. We don't use wretchedness very much. I, I'm bringing wretchedness back. I feel like uh, it's a better word than incel, for example, because incel implies that the problem is that the guy can't have sex. But it's not actually the problem. <laughs> but so wretchedness is the sense of, uh, and you know, um, Martin Luther, the guy who did the Protestant Reformation, a 95 thesis, he described himself as feeling wretched at some point. He's like, oh, God has forsaken me. I, I'm a sinner. I'm such a despairing loser, you know. And, and his mentor was like, you know, stop, stop fixating on your sins. That's still kind of narcissistic. Like, focus your attention on... So he was saying, like, the love of Christ. But you could also say, focus on what you want to see more of, right? Focus on the good stuff. And uh, I, I do think that, like, when dealing with insane possibility space, it's basically magic. And... Is this is another one of the essays I'm working on um, called Universal Cursed Artifact, right? Which is that everybody, so every smartphone is a kind of magic mirror, a kind of crystal ball. And, you know, in Snow White, for example, the Wicked Witch has a magic mirror and she asks a question that she can't handle the answer to, that someone else is prettier than her, and she basically goes insane. And now everybody has a smartphone, so everybody has access to information that they might not be ready to receive. And so there's like multiple parts to solving this problem, right? One is 
um, some people want to put restrictions on the magic mirror itself, which is, I, I I understand the impulse. I do feel like that ship has sailed somewhat. It's like we have to, you know, so like in fiction, we have all these, uh, oh, if you want to join the wizard association, not the wizard clan, you've got to go for training before you get to touch the crystal ball. Like you have to steal yourself. You have to be a person of virtue and not, not give in to your temptations to ask for something that you shouldn't ask for. Like, you know, we have all these cautionary tales like Midas touch and stuff like that. And now it's like, oh, well, every child has a crystal ball in their hands, right? Well, what are we going to do? And we, we don't have, you know, there's, we have to educate ourselves. We're really building the plane in midair while we are falling through the sky. But we probably can do it. That's the crazy, that's the insane, exciting thing about being alive, right? Um, but yeah, so I do think that the wretchedness problem is real, the wretchedness spiral where, you know, you have some negative beliefs about yourself. You go online, you can find any evidence to confirm your negative beliefs about anything or positive beliefs if you want, right? So it's, you, you have that choice. And, you know, so half of what I do, so what I've done so far with like Friendly Ambitious Nerd and so I think introspect is somewhere in between. So Friendly Ambitious Nerd is a vision of how we can use possibility space to spiral positively into better and better outcomes. Introspect is kind of how to consider how you might have some negative spirals in you and like identify them so that you don't get like dragged by them against your will. Uh, but I do want to do a bit more kind of um, helping people. I don't know if I can help the people who are like the worst, like down bad, like really, really bad. I think like those people need a certain kind of professional help that I might not be able to do much for. But for like regular people who feel like they're struggling with that stuff, I think I can help. And again, it's it's interesting. Like I, I have to reflect on how come I'm good at this? Like, you know, it's not like, and it's, it it's, how, meaning how come I'm good at like chaos surfing, right? Like dealing with possibility space and coming out of it optimistic and cheerful and not, you know, like overwhelmed. And I think part of it is like my childhood background being like a minority with a weird name and like being, so being Singaporean again, it's like being at this cultural crossroads between East and West. But like I was saying elsewhere, like a lot of Singaporeans, I think don't develop like this global cu curiosity because of like, so the, the word that David Deutsch used a lot is uh, parochial, which I love. Like it's it's a way of saying like old fashioned and kind of stodgy, and it's 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 by using a slightly different word, you avoid a lot of connotations that that people would assume that you're saying. Like so, it's it's almost it's a negative way to say something that we might loosely associate with conservative, but because it's not saying conservative, people don't assume that it's like a political idea, right? It's just. Parochial. It's this old fashioned, old timey, non involved way of, of seeing things. Right. So, yeah, I, I do think Singapore has like this remarkably late onset parochialism, which is like, I, and I think that's fixable, especially because it's so recent. Like, the country itself is like 55 ish years old, but it's like we've already in three generations become like very, become very, like you were saying, right? Like, um, stasis is death and movement is life. Like, you know, I think it's a Paul Graham essay where he says something like, some startup founders are very nimble with ideas. It's like, they're moving a lot. They're like jumping around, bouncing off things. And some people in idea space, they're like frail old people. So they're afraid that if they go, to, if they, they move around so gingerly because it's like, if they go hard on an idea, they might like fall and hurt themselves. Right. And Singapore feels like, to me, growing up here, right? Like, I, I love this country, but I also, uh, James Baldwin had a quote. He's saying something like, I love America and as such, I reserve the right to criticize her indefinitely. And I feel the same way as a Singaporean. Like, I love my country and I feel the right to criticize. And I, I feel like, yeah, like in a very short amount of time, we've experienced a lot of economic success, but we've like, like we're afraid of, of what, you know, we're afraid to break it. We're afraid to drop it. And then it becomes stiff. And it's the same. I mean, it's kind of like a, you know, a lot of artists, they do a great first album and then they get a sophomore slump because they don't know how to, how do you do a how do you do a second act, right? Like where you do something fresh but also similar, but also it's just very difficult. And uh, yeah, there's so much stuff going on. I, I I'm just realizing now that this is the first like intelligent conversation I've had in months because I'm always talking to my baby and like oh, there's all this stuff stewing in my head. Um, yeah. So to try and recap everything, you you asking about possibility space. There's so much going on. Um. We need to help people who are struggling with it, manage it better, uh, find the people who are doing it well and encourage them to do it better still with each other. It's like there's, there's many kind of parts to it. 
And it's like there's like opportunity. There's so much opportunity for people to like get involved and and like refresh life, refresh the species, refresh thinking. Like uh, I still believe that a good blog post or a good essay can change the world. I still I still be- like even a good video or a good movie or a good something that presents like a fresh way of thinking or a fresh way of seeing things. And it doesn't need to be like completely novel in a way that's never ever been done before but like just something sufficiently inspiring challenging provoking you know giving people something to kind of uh not revolve around but like uh you know i i i think one of my stranger beliefs is that like a lot of what people think are the problems with the present day are like problems with language like just the words that we use and the way that we read or don't read and and like our, it's, it's, again, this goes back to possibility space again. It's like we are constrained by our lack of imagination and our imagination is constrained by like our language. And if we're only using the same few words, then we only think the same few thoughts. And then like, we don't see different possibilities. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just rambling. <laughs> You're not rambling. Uh, I couldn't agree more on the problem of language. Labels are convenient but they are also confining. And, yeah. and what, what happens with people, in my opinion, is when, you, when they become label thinkers, they, they literally stop thinking, right? I, I wrote a multi-part uh, thread called The Thinker and the Prover for Twitter. Mm. And, nice. and basically, the, the thinker can think anything it wants, literally. Mm-hmm. The thinker would be translating in our vernacular the thinker is the uh, idea space, right? So you you can you can think uh, you know three impossible things before breakfast, as Lewis Carroll said in Alice in Wonderland. But often what happens is as we as after we thought, yeah, this is right, we kick it over to the prover, and and the prover has one job, and that job is to make you right, to make your idea correct, and so. What happens is I think that we sometimes get caught up in the prover space, right? But then I would bring in, to paraphrase Victor Hugo, no army can stop an idea whose time has come. And, yeah. and, and so the, that is the tension, in my opinion. The tension is there's a lot of people. There are many, many people who belong in this idea space, right? And haven't gotten there yet, but I think that the ability, your idea that a blog can change the world, I agree. And the more access they have, I love your idea about the smartphone, right? Being the magic mirror. Um, can can bad things happen? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, if you don't acknowledge that, then you're just pan glossy and in your outlook, and you know that's that's right. not going to really carry you through. But the idea of the inquisitive mirror. Go ahead, jump in. No, I was just gonna say every every tool is a weapon. Like in the creative hands, right? So if you have a whatever anything that can make anything that can accomplish things, right? Like if you can if you can build something really fast, you can build a thing that drops on people and kills them. Like this, you know, if if it if you want to make something that has effects there's always some creative way you can weaponize it, right? And and the inverse is also, I think, true. Like, if there's any kind of weapon, you can probably find some way to use it for good or just use, like, this, if you strip it down to first principles, right, what does this, th- what does this tool do, right? Every, everything is a kind of hammer, everything is a kind of so on and so forth. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned um, Lewis Carroll. And yeah, I was, just, I, was, I was just thinking when you said that, like, who is today's Lewis Carroll? You know, like... Alice in Wonderland as an as a idea, as a motif, is so strong. Like it's still remixed into The Matrix. You know, it's remixed into so much media everywhere. I don't you know, maybe, maybe I, so I think I've had revisit Lewis Carroll like on, in my to-do list somewhere buried under some pile of things. But yeah, you know, how, I, I do wonder, how do people who have managed to open everyone's eyes around them to possibility or to like considering an alternate way of seeing things or doing things. Uh, I was just listening, this is completely random, but I was just listening to an interview with John Cena on 
Kelly Clarkson show. John Cena being the wrestler, Kelly Clarkson's singer. And she was saying to him, you are such a lovely person, so much integrity, so much everything, like all the qualities that we would want in a political leader. Would you ever go into politics? And I love so much that I have so much resonance with what John Cena said. John Cena was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to go into politics. And he said, um, I do what I can from... So I'm completely paraphrasing his thing into my words because I say similar things. He's like, I do what I can from where I'm at. But no, no, what he said was, if we can influence enough people to care about things appropriately and get involved appropriately, or I guess more succinctly, if you can elevate the public enough, you don't necessarily need like um, superhuman political leaders to accomplish things for the people because the people will basically accomplish it themselves. Which, you know, again, like we're skipping a bunch of steps here and there, but like it makes sense to me, right? Like we roughly get, you know, the leaders that we quote unquote deserve or it's like it's, like, it's a strange loop, right? It's the people and the politicians or whatever the, the, the structure of power is in some ecosystem. And we now have this very interesting opportunity, which is like in the last 50 years, like even last couple of decades right since since we got the magic mirror right since since we got the magic mirror we now can directly engage with people and mass this is not a new you know like it used to be that and i love this this thing that um who pointed this out alain de baton he pointed out that in his book the news he pointed out that uh if you were to overthrow a government right so this happens in a lot of like third world countries and stuff like oh in anywhere where they you 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 the moment you've successfully done a coup, what's the first thing you do? The first thing you do is you drive to the news headquarters and then you do a broadcast and say, announcement, breaking news, there's new people in charge. This is the new government. And you have to do that because you need to get that information into everybody's minds. And it used to be that whoever controlled the flow of information controlled everything, right? Uh, I'm skipping some steps, but like, you know, oversimplifying slightly, but it, it the, the media is the nervous system of the species, right? And this is why I really, I really want to reread Marshall McLuhan. I have the book somewhere here, but like he he really got into like the depth of things, and I I feel like he's he he is he remains underappreciated to this day, Marshall McLuhan. Like he really foresaw how people's relationship with the media um, intermediates everything, like how we conceive of. Like, you know, in like the history of how radio and TV enabled states to exist in a way that they couldn't exist prior because it was not possible to coordinate people at that scale. And so one of my core theses is like, so real social media has never been tried. And the analogy, I, I don't know, I, I feel like I might have brought this up in our last podcast, but I'll say it again just in case. Um, you know, the electric guitar was invented in like 1940 something. Like, so there were guitars before that, and then people put pickups on guitars around the 1940s. But like, I, I argue that really the electric guitar was born, came into fruition with Jimi Hendrix. And that was like 1970-something, right? So Woodstock 69, right? Like almost 30 years from, so like theoretically, hypothetically, the possibility existed that if you could drop Jimi Hendrix in 1940-something, you could have had that moment then maybe but the limiting factor for the electric guitar to happen was that you needed someone like Hendrix to show up who did not conceive of the electric guitar as oh it's like an acoustic guitar but louder you needed someone who saw it from first principles to be like I can do anything I want with this I don't have to treat it like a guitar I can treat it like a screaming wailing banshee and that took roughly 30 years from the start of the, the lifetime of Jimi Hendrix and I feel that social media today has been around for 15 plus years, 20, 20 years, depending on how you see it. And smartphones have been around, depending on how you see it, like 15-ish years. And people approach it with their old thinking. So this is like the horseless carriage thing. We still think of social media as, oh, it's like broadcast media, but with your phones. And it's like, no, it's, it's a completely different way of, coordinating a way of different way of imagining things like the just as the radio changed the concept of the nation state radio and tv and books like social media is changing 
the way people can conceive of themselves in tribes and in fandoms. And, you know, have you been to a Taylor Swift concert yet? It's the most, I just went like last week with my wife. It's our first date night. It's um, it's amazing. She sells out like six, a stadium six times, just like 300,000 people, you know, in, in in a week. Like the Taylor Swift religion slash fandom is unco- it's like incredibly powerful and it's like so Swifties understand how big that is but like mainstream understanding has not caught up to that yet like the amount of power that uh, celebrity slash influencer can have it's like they're basically they have the capacity to be like nation they, they are the leaders of their own nations in a sense and when people say things like do you want to why don't you run for politics it's like you're still thinking in the old way of organizing human behavior right like why do you need to be in political office to have power and influence so even even during the time of like lincoln i remember emerson was quoting saying something like um emerson said you know for for the to give the impression of being you know having the highest honors the a man has to debase some of his best qualities to like sit uh with be sit at the throne while the people with the real power are like behind the throne, you know, pulling strings or whatever. I mean, it sounds a little bit conspir- conspiratorial, but like, it makes sense. Like, you have to com- make all these compromises because you're so visible and you have all these challenges. Whereas, like, you know, if you think really from first principles about like, what are the outcomes you want? And like, do we really need to go through the channels that of the past? Like, are you familiar with the with the joke about um, the pot roast and like grandma's pot roast? So it's it's like yeah like why do we why do we cut off the ends oh because grandma said we do why do we cut so you ask her you ask her oh it's because the part was too small so yeah we are we are all like that all the time and all of human social reality is pot roast that's cut with the with the ends cut off and like how do we begin to help people see that we can not do that right and I I've seen so like on social media for example like the thing I'm talking about with uh. So the, the the way that we evaluate broadcast media success was scale and scope. Like the most person with the most followers is the winner. That's not at all true today. Or it doesn't have to be true in according to the games you want to play. But people are so used to old ways of thinking that even some of my smartest friends, they feel like, oh, shouldn't I want to grow my following raw numbers? Shouldn't I do what gets you more views? And it's like, maybe. But like, what is the outcome you actually want? Like people forget to think that because they're just inherited this old ways of thinking so yeah it's, it's like it's exciting that alternative ways are possible and i guess we need more stories and more examples of like what can happen and i'm seeing it happen like you know like the people like a bunch of our twitter mutuals like people are organizing events and they're organizing meetups and they're like moving together around the same neighborhoods and there's all this very interesting activity that's starting to happen so i'm very excited about that I tell you, man, you you just wrote three books right there. Yeah. There's yeah. there is so there is so much to unpack, and again, we are incredibly simpatico on these ideas because I've been reading rereading the book Power vs. Force. He chooses. Mm-hmm. I I wish he wouldn't have used the the term power because Hawkins? again because of yeah Hawkins because okay. of the the label figures. Power has a very different uh, meaning than it does in Hawkins' sense. And I do believe that we are at a place where we are moving from historically the way society was organized was through force, was through political machinations, was through who controls the nervous system of society, which is media, right? And, And everything was force, which links us back to Lao Tzu, right? What is the greatest leader? The greatest leader is one who the people say, we did it ourselves. And then he goes down the line saying, like, who's the worst leader? Who rules by fear, intimidation, et cetera. And, and moving from that sort of scarcity mindset, force, to the abundance mindset of power. But he's using, Hawkins is using power in the way that I think you and I understand it which is influence, not, yeah. not, not compelling you. I'm not going to say, Visa, you must do this. Right. I'm going to try to influence you to think, hey, I might want to like look into that. That might be interesting. 
And yeah. I just finished a, an, an author I really like, Howard Bloom, who wrote uh, The Lucifer Principle and The God Problem. And I, I just finished a book about his time as a uh, promoter of, of music, which I thought was really interesting. But he's got this great example in it where he says, if you, you can put a lot of salt into a beaker, and if you boil that beaker and then let it cool, the salt becomes invisible to the eye. And, and he says, however, if you drop a single grain of salt into it, what you see is all of the salt comes together because of that, the introduction of that one grain of salt. And he uses that as the metaphor for the Taylor Swifts of the world. He right. says, great right. artists, great yeah. artists are that single drop. And what it allows is many people who thought they were weird or thought that no one else thinks this way. They, you drop that in like a Taylor Swift and suddenly you see that, no, 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 there is a huge mass of people that feel the same way. Right. And and yeah. and I think these tools that we have now for the first time allow us to do this, right? To drop that single grain of salt into the beaker. Yeah. Because in the past, like everything, as you pointed out, was was devoted towards numbers, right? Who wins? Mm -hmm. Well, I Love Lucy had 69 million viewers, right? right. And so we had a monoculture, and that was really the only way you created a counterculture. Now, like everything can be its own culture and its own area, but that doesn't mean they can't intersect at very that's, interesting at very interesting points. That's very. You just helped me cl clarify something that I I I, I was stewing on, but I didn't quite know what to make of it. Okay, so you know, I I think a lot of people um, who admire past countercultures want to participate in something that feels like a counterculture in need. Like, you know, in some sense, like trying to do something better, trying to make something great, whatever. But um, nothing feels quote-unquote countercultural anymore because there is no monoculture, right? So the interesting thing there means, I'm, I'm like connecting the dots in real time, it means that if you want to create some kind of new culture, you have, you know, you, so the cool thing is you have the freedom to do it but I guess the difficult thing is you don't really have a convenient, you know, monarch to rail against, right? So you have, which means, which is, which means that you have to say what you're for rather than what you're against, which is, which is, you know, again, like the first line on my Twitter bio is focus on what you want to see more of. And so I'm always preaching that, I guess. But um, it's interesting to connect the dots about, I hadn't thought to think of how does this relate back to how people used to think about monocultures and countercultures. So thanks for that. I think this, I think that's gonna be there might be an essay in that somewhere, like helping people see why the language of counterculture is no longer quite relevant. Or like it's does if it's not working, that's probably why. Like there's something there. It's interesting. I also think, you know, you mentioned who is our uh, Lewis Carroll today. Well, mm. I, I I wrote several term papers about him and Alice in Wonderland in college. Of and, course and, you basic, did. <laughs> and 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 basically, um, it, it, we also have to remember that he was a famed uh, logician, uh, mm. Charles Dodgson, right? And yeah. if you if you if you look at Alice in Wonderland through the lens of uh, you know what the tortoise said to Achilles, um, it, which is what he wrote as Dodgson. Basically, it's he was talking about Agrippa's trilemma, right? That mm -hmm. Agrippa was an ancient uh, Greek philosopher who basically pointed out the fact that you can never get down to ultimate truth through logic, and yeah. and that's what what the tortoise said to Achilles is also about, right? It's basically if you look at all of the logical axioms, right, and and you go, okay. If A is true, or if B is true, then A is true. Anyway, what Carol wrote in a very brief thing that is really like mind bending is that if you get down to the final axiom, right, the, the ground state axiom, what you're going to find is there is no evidence. A human basically asserted this is true. 
And then we built the rest of it on top of that human assertion. And when you think about that, the idea that the it, it opens possibility space enormously, right? Because essentially it 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 acknowledges we are all living in reality tunnels. We're not living yes. in reality, right? Correct. We are yeah. living in our version, and my version and your version might be really similar. In fact, I have kind of a pet theory that when you really vibe with somebody, what you're really doing is your your reality tunnels really kind of align. And right. when they align, the resonance the, you, you res, the resonance goes off the charts, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. and so that doesn't mean that you can't interact with people with very different reality tunnels. But where you got to start is you've got to understand that the map is not the territory. You mm-hmm. you and and that's one of our fundamental problems, in my opinion. People yeah. like most of my opinions are probably wrong. And mm-hmm. if 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 I'm open to being willing to say that, then then you get to be a lot more playful you get to look at a lot more ideas you mm. because right you, you you don't it's like you another thing you always see on twitter this is a hill i'll die on and, right. and i always <laughs> i always joke i'm i'm of the view of general patent which is i want to let the other poor dumb bastard die on his hill <laughs> right. yeah and 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 so i think that one of the things you're uniquely good at is creating that space where reality tunnels kind of collide. And and I don't mean collide in a bad way. I mean it in a, oh, I never thought about that. What do you think? Uh, that's a very that's a very gracious it's an excellent compliment because one is very kind and it's also it's true I think it's true. And I also think I hadn't quite thought to frame it for myself that way. And I think it's a useful description i think I, I i can use that like i can you know like so i could write something about reality tunnel collision or overlap or framing or something and that that is that again like yeah this i i do periodically wake up with like the mystery of how come i seem to be good at what i do and most people don't right and it's like yeah i spent a bunch of time i i, I allocated my resources a bit weirdly but it seemed obvious to me right that this is how we should do things um yeah like that's that's so that's very interesting. So like you know so okay let's starting over again. Everybody has different reality tunnels. Um, when we have good collisions, amazing things can happen. When you have bad collisions, there's conflict and like war and everything. And so the question becomes, how do you create like sandbox environments or contexts in which people can, in good faith, collide their reality tunnels and potentially see things that they couldn't see by themselves or like without each other's help. And it's funny, that reminds me, like sometimes people ask me like, what is my end goal with connecting? And this goes back to McLuhan as well, right? Like, uh, and and Ezra Pound, right? Like, what is the point of bringing together all these wonderful people? Like, what do you want them to do? And I'm like, I don't know. If I knew, I, I would just say what I want. But I want the collective to imagine what I cannot imagine. And that comes from the reality tunnels colliding, right? So I only have my reality tunnel and you have yours. They're similar. They're slightly different. We bang in some way, some, some sparks that can be interesting. But like, what if you have a dozen of us and each person kind of focuses on a different thing? And then you have like, you have like a prism of some kind, like what, what can you make? Right. And, and what will you see that no one else is seeing? And sometimes, you know, you have, you have a dozen people, you, you get everyone together for a discussion on topic X, and then you discuss topic X for an hour. It seems all right. And then you all go for drinks afterwards and someone makes a joke. And that joke somehow just sets everyone off and you're like, there's something incredible there that somehow is, again, it's beyond the scope of what was discussed prior. But because everyone has attunement in some way, there's just something there. And then, like, yeah, I, I just watched this video of, um, so one of my favorite comedians these days is Taylor Tomlinson. And she's now hosting this thing called after midnight, which is like a daily recap of internet culture or something like that. And this is I'm this not really an important detail, but like uh so there's a video of like an ostrich race and all the comedians on the panel are making are like trying to make jokes about the the ostrich race, like a guy on an ostrich racing. And one guy spots that in the background of the ostrich race, there's a kid and his dad watching, and he puts on a voice pretending to be the kid. 
and be like, Dad, why why doesn't mommy here with us anymore? Like whatever. And like it's not I mean and Taylor just loses her shit. She's like laughing. She she almost can't continue hosting the show. And it's even just witnessing that I found it so enlivening and I, I enjoy it like, deeply watching that this tiny segment of you know, so there, there, there's a comedy show of some kind. There's and uh, it's like a game show format, but like it has. So while it's a game show format, they are not fixated on sticking to the format. It's like if anything interesting happens, it's improv rules, right? Like if anything interesting happens, you're obliged to go with the interestingness. And so this this comedian comes up with this on the fly joke of an unrelated thing, and it just sets off the host that she is laughing uncontrollably, and I feel like it's related. It's like there was no way at the start of the show for any of them to have planned that out. And if they had planned it out, it would not have evoked that response. And in, in themselves, in the audience, it's like that unexpectedness. Like how do you how do we design for unexpectedness? I think is or like how how do we yeah, like whatever this there's a good chance, it seems to me, it seems likelier than not, that the grand solutions of our time will be things that we cannot currently see or imagine or even describe. Which is crazy. Like, that's crazy. How do we do that, right? So we're going to have to collide reality tunnels and, you know, there's something like between what you see and what I see, there may be something neither of us sees from the friction in between. Like, it's like, I think, I can't remember who said, who said um, the best thing for a scientist to say is not everything's going according to plan, but, hmm, that's strange. You know, <laughs> they're like, what, what's exactly. this? Right, yeah. So yeah, the uh, uh, the idea that that it's one of the reasons why I'm such a strong supporter of open source uh, software and mm -hmm. in the current AI debates because mm -hmm. co cognitive diversity is basically mm -hmm. what you're just talking about, right? So if like, and and I'm always using the same quote, but it really fits beautifully, which is. No matter how brilliant somebody is, no matter how intuitively insightful, no matter how clever, you can never ask them to make a list of things that would never occur to them. And the idea is by putting together different types of minds, that's where the magic happens. And you also have to be willing to be open to the idea that we're going in. We don't know. We can't. That's why committees ruin everything, right? They because <laughs> not not only are they not diverse for the most part of in, at least cognitively, but but they go in like we're going to accomplish X, Y, and Z, and 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 they they really turn it into a bollocks. When you when you create, I love the idea of creating an environment, a sandbox in which you can invite diverse, clever creative, curious people, that's where magic, I think, has the uh, opportunity to really happen. That's almost a, a perfect description of like what Miles Davis accomplished in jazz, like exactly. over his career. Right? He just brought in young musicians from random environments and like just put them together. They would say, hey, Miles, shouldn't we rehearse? And he's like, no, I pay you to rehearse on stage in front of the crowd and make your mistakes there and fix them on the spot. Like, I don't want you to play stuff that you've prepared. I want you to be at the edge of your comfort and ability and like push the limits on stage. And then they're like, oh, the crowd's not going to like that. He's, then he said, um, I'll, I'll handle the crowd. You just play. And I'm like, there's, there's so much there. And you know, he, he was an exceptional case study and like, until he died, he was constantly at the cutting edge of what he was doing. Like he never calcified. He never got into the death of stasis. Right. And it, it, it's, it's, the strange thing to me is that he is not more, and not just like so. Miles Davis is one example, but there's like a dozen examples I could get into of like people who accomplish remarkable things, and then they seem to be like under theorized. And I, I guess it's because people assume that it's esoteric genius. Like there's something about them that's like we should just worship that. Oh, there's something in their childhood, or there's something in their whatever. And it's like I'm like, no, what 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 are the chops? Like what 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 do they do? Like can we learn from what they do? Right? Like I'm I'm always on that. I was going to say something else as well. Um, what were we saying before the sandbox thing? We, we were talking about co cognitive diversity, diversity and how it can help with sparks of new can ideas. Can you? Oh, uh, can you make a list of things that would never occur to you? I actually have an interesting, like, uh, so there's like the the grand version of that, which is like, 
an idea that you've never thought of. But I can actually point to you like a very um, mundane version of this, which which is um, so I I've written a book, right? And and when I share it with people, uh, when people read it, they quote from it. And the interesting to me, interesting thing to me is when readers emphasize quotes that I did not think were quote worthy in a in a particular sense. So it's like my readers emphasize parts of my books that I didn't think to emphasize. So like I have a paragraph somewhere about like, so the paragraph starts with like doing hundred things and like how to something, something about helping people. And then like almost a throwaway sentence towards the end. And I'm like, and the worst way of, the worst way to help someone or the worst way to serve someone is to try to fix them. Like as though you know better than them and you're going to tell them what to do. And I just meant that as a throwaway sentence at the end of the thing. But someone quoted it with, like, so he screenshotted the whole paragraph and then he just put the text, the worst way to serve someone. And I was like, huh, that's, a, that's an excellent sentence. Oh, I, I wrote that. Oh, I did. But like, I didn't think that was an important sentence. It was just a throwaway thing, right? So that's a very, like, and, and it's it's a striking example to me because um, I can honestly say that I can't take credit for that. Like, I was just, I was just talking, you know, I was just writing out stuff. And if that reader hadn't spotted that quote and quoted it, I would not have thought to emphasize that. And it's objectively, once I see someone emphasize it, I'm like, oh shit, that's a great sentence, right? And a productive scene, a productive, like a group of friends who are, you know, riffing and jamming and quoting each other. I always say on Twitter, like people should quote one another because you should quote your friends a lot because your friends don't have the freedom to... No, so, so, I mean, so, okay, uh, the, the interesting thing about quotes is that it's understood that a quote is not necessarily the entirety of what someone says. So I could say, uh, you know, I could, I could quote you and I could do a tweet that's like, quote, um, why committees ruin everything, unquote, slash, dash, Jim O'Shaughnessy, right? And like, you wouldn't have to defend that sentence with an essay because it's understood that I'm quoting something from you and like and do you get what I'm saying it's like when each person is speaking for themselves there's this expectation that they're supposed to like defend everything they say with like a dissertation but when people are quoting each other there is a lot it's kind of an annoying it's a quirk of like how social reality works I think that people are more charitable with hearsay and like second order like second but you know, you know what it is it's a it's it's the same logic of frame stories you know, the narrative device where instead of... So, like, even, like, so many ancient folklore does this, which is, like, the story of Sinbad the Sailor begins with, oh, this guy met this other guy at a, at a like, by the beach or by somewhere. And then he says, have you heard the story of Sinbad the Sailor? Well, I met this guy one day. And so anything good in the story is because the story is good. Anything bad in the story, well, the storyteller is probably crap. So it's not it's not the author's fault. It's the that imperfect storyteller's fault. Uh, which is such a great device, right? La like Shaharazid and the Thousand and One Arabian Nights. It's the same same idea. And you can put in all these um and this is also connected. So it's like I, I have like a dozen essays. I'm basically telling you about all of them that I'm trying to work on, and they're all connected. This is also connected to language and it's also connected to possibility space where when people feel like they have to be the sole custodian of their idea and present it as if it's a finished, polished product that can't be that has to be perfect, they just won't do it or they'll procrastinate forever or they'll like have one idea in a dozen years or something. But if you give people the freedom to present imperfect, unfinished, kinda interesting, I don't know where this is going, but maybe it's something you know, then they can be much more creative and um, you know, it it's like a clever way to avoid the retaliation against um, creativity where it's like oh you know that's not a good idea it's, well yeah he, here is an unfinished you know I heard this thing from that guy like you have a problem I, I heard this at the market today and someone's like well that person at the market's an idiot well maybe you know it's, it's, well, I don't know <laughs> like it's not me right and so yeah giving people the f- the freedom to be somewhat detached from their ideas and not uh, not identify with them so strongly so that if it's wrong it's fine I, I, I think that's going to be an important part of like cultivating a healthy scene of reality tunnel collision something like that I'm, 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 I'm workshopping it I'm going to it's, it's going to be good when you I, I think you know you can tell right? there's, there's something there I completely, <laughs> completely agree and one of the things that 
worked really well for me that I got from Jed McKenna and I really internalized was I just look at myself as the co-creator of everything I think up. And, and, and when you think about yourself as the co-creator internally, that reframes you in such a powerful way of like you were just uh, giving the examples of uh, Sinbad and the Shahrazad and the uh, night of all the stories. It, it allows you to also tame your own ego, right? Yes. When 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 you think, listen, I'm a co-creator here. It it it, it takes away that mine, mine, mine. This is mine, and you can't touch it. Or no visa. This is my idea, and I'm going to hang on to it. I'm going to defend it. I'm going to write essays about it, and. It tames the ego to such a degree that it allows you to like not only welcome that, but encourage mm-hmm. that. It's like, yeah, it's, yeah. hey, Visa, what do you think about it? Right? Yeah. So, so in fact, like, so right now, if anyone has been listening to this so far and they've heard some of the stuff that we've been talking about, and they think, huh, I would totally like to write an essay about that, but oh, I can't because it's Visa's idea. I said, please. Please take it off my plate. Like, please write your version of whatever you, you think I've just said. And I will be delighted to share it with my people, my audience, whatever. Like, like again, like we are all we are all collectively co-creating this idea space, possibility space together. And like I, I don't need to be Visa is the author of this idea, right? Like I just want to see these ideas be remixed and you know, I just want more possibility space. Um you know, more, more bubbling in in the in the primordial soup of of the time that we're in right now. And so, if, if anybody wants to write anything about anything <laughs> in in this domain, like I'm, I would be thrilled to read it. Right, and and, you, you would, and yeah, yeah, same with me. Uh, and and on the idea of you know uh, colliding ideas, different traditions, etc. Like that's what America used to be in physical space. Yes, right. Yes. It's it's not surprising that jazz is mm. an American creation, right? Yeah. Had, had and, to be. and 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 it's not surprising that hip hop is mostly uh-huh. an American creation, right? Correct. Because because we had uh, all of these people. Everyone in America is from somewhere else, ultimately, yeah. right? Yeah. And and so it's another reason why I'm I'm like so pounding the table about us having sensible uh immigration policies like yeah right. come on yeah it's yeah. it's this combination of and what they used to an old term that i'd never hear anymore america was a melting pot right, right? yeah we're, we're we're literally if you like chase down some ideas that were you well pragmatism is another great example right if you chase down emerson you chase down thoreau you chase down walt whitman Etc., and you try to isolate, right? Well, where did this yeah. idea have its origins? Right, like e- everywhere, <laughs> because yeah. we put we put all of the high, and that's the other part. What was typical about the early people who came to America, and even people coming here now, high agency, yeah, and the willingness to abandon all that is familiar and comfortable and all of that from the country of origin and yeah. light out to come here. Right? right. And, and, and we can do this in idea space now, in my opinion. Yeah. You just reminded me, there's this great story of, uh, the artist Yaoi Kusama. So she's like Japanese origin, but she's, she's 100% American. And then the moment that you know that, because when she decided to like, she has this great, her, her origin story is like, she knew that she couldn't do what she wanted to do in Japan at the time that she was young, it was like a completely different world. And like she burnt all of her artworks right before getting on the boat to the US. And you just read that story and like, that is so American. Like, like just that, that willingness to be like, I, I always tell my friends like, uh, um, like there's that spirit of fuck you, I can do it. You know, like, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll get it done. Like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. And same for like Arnold Schwarzenegger. There's a photo of when Arnold became a citizen. He's holding the flag. and But even then, you know, he was, he was 
like in this rural part of Austria and he was like, I got to I want to be a bodybuilder and the only way I can do that is to go to the US and like there's just this, there's something about that spirit which you know some people say has like dimmed a little bit or something but like it's clearly still there from it's I think it can be more obvious from the outside because from the outside you can see you know sometimes sometimes in Asia for example when people try to do irreverent maverick shit people say this isn't America you can't just do that and it's like and then the people think of well then if I want to do shit I got to go to the America right and like maybe when they get there they're like oh maybe the market the the PR around this country is not you know, the, the country might not perfectly live up to its ideals, but it, at least it has them, right? Because elsewhere, those ideals don't even really exist. They're like, uh, you know, what can you do? You can't do anything. And the US is like, at least you say that you can do stuff and sometimes you do it. And it's like, you know, great. Let's, let's you know, more of that, please. And, and, and I think that that's the other wonder of the magic mirrors, right? Yeah. The, yeah. We, it's really easy to t- change your digital zip code. It's really hard yes. to change your physical That's zip true. code. That's true. And, and, and now, and also the other thing, as I was listening to you, like that sprang into my mind is a lot of people don't understand how new all this shit is. That's true. Yeah. Like, like if you read Bill Bryson's story of America one summer, I think 1921, you uh-huh. realize, holy shit, the first time that the guy announcing Lindbergh's landing on radio, that was the first human to speak to more than a million humans simultaneously. And right. that my father was alive. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? And yeah. and and then when you look at like just the, how much the world has changed since I was born in 1960. Like right. in 1971, a woman in America could not have a credit card without her husband's permission. How fucked up is that? And so rather to think, oh, that's really fucked up. I always look at it the other way around. Look at how far we have come in yeah. such a short period. Now, yeah. does that mean that I think that we that like there isn't still more to do? There's always more so, to do. Yeah. There's always more to do. If you basically have great ideas and great innovations and great progress, you're creating a better set of problems, but you're creating problems. (laughs) So so, so this idea that things are going to be, that's why utopia, there is no such place as utopia Mm. in the material or in this reality tunnel in which Mm -hmm. we find ourselves. And and that's why, again, quoting one of my previous guests, uh, perfection is a 100% tax. And, mm, and, oh, and good. right. And, and so the idea that the, you know, and, and this is said a million different ways, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Right. Yeah. And, and, but what that's getting across is th- that frame of reference is always going to fail you. And mm. the, the reason why the, why I'm so in favor of everything that's going on right now is back to your idea of possibility space. Possibility space is bigger than it's ever been in human history, in my opinion. Correct. Easily, yeah. By a lot, by by a ridiculous amount. It's not like twice. By a ridiculous, ridiculous, oh no, <laughs> by a ridiculous, <laughs> ridiculous yeah. amount. And <laughs> so the the like I I I am just so chuffed, man, about yeah. the world and where we find ourselves. And Hey. I, 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 it sometimes, uh, uh, bumps me out when I just see the, the constant refrain of pessimism and, oh, mm. we could, you know, that, and, and, and that's why I, I love people like you because mm. you open minds to right. the, the Pessim- possibilities. Pess- pessimism is really funny to me, actually. Like, so again, like, you know, so the general refrain of pessimism is that things don't work, but like, look back. 10 years in your own life. 10 years ago, gay marriage was illegal in the US. And it did not... It, 10 years ago, you know, like and like in 2014, pessimists would say, oh, it's never going to happen. I, I considered myself an optimist in 2014. If you ask me in 2014, will the US legalize same-sex next year? I would say, mm, maybe another 10 years. And then I'm like, oh shit, what the fuck do I know about? Like I have, I have allowed the pessimists, because I'm trying to be a, like a sensible, reasonable person. So I'm like, Change is possible, but 
the, a lot of pessimists seem to think it's not possible. So somewhere in between, maybe things will take 20 years. It took an, another year and it's done. Like, and uh, I think one of the Wright brothers, he said, two years before they made flight, he himself said, we're not going to make flight for 50 years. And then two years later, they did it. And then he's like, I have since distrusted, distrusted myself as a prophet of what is possible. right? Because it's like, so don't let your your limited imagination and concepts like prevent you from accomplishing what you cannot imagine, right? Because our imaginations are so limited. Again, it's like you said, the thing you were saying about um, you can't make a list of things that would never occur to you, right? Like, it, so it never occurred to me that I could get David Deutsch on my podcast or my YouTube channel. Like, I, I not conceive of it at all. So all, how that happened was I was open to possibility and it came along and I was prepared enough to be like, oh yeah, sure, I can show up and I can talk and we can make it work. And like, yeah. So I got more to say about pessimism. <laughs> it's like, um, you know, so one, I have a blog post somewhere titled like status quo soldiers, which is there are a lot of people who are very, you know, I get it. They're anxious about change and they're worried about things. Like I, I get the the emotional quality of why people are status quo soldiers. But like, if there's one thing that has never lasted, it's the status quo because it's always changing. <laughs> like, right. you know, it's, and so like what you're investing all of this time and effort and energy into trying to preserve something that's already gone. It's like, like it, you, you know, it's like um, while uh, it's really while you're busy telling people what can't be done, other people are already doing it. So <laughs> it's it's just and especially people who try to persuade other people of pessimism like so like I, i've joked before that um you know if you're truly despairing if you truly think that all is hopeless you wouldn't do anything and you wouldn't say anything you'll just be kind of despondent but to decide to go around telling other people what can or cannot be done there's an optimism in that you believe <laughs> that what you you believe that what you say has impact you believe that you can change people's minds you believe that communication is a worthwhile thing to do so there's some part of you that's optimistic about the utility of pessimism, or you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't say stuff to people. And, and the, that again goes back to the thing about most human creativity was expended suppressing creativity. And it's like, yeah, so like we you, we have magical powers and we use it to create the illusion that nothing is magical. Everything is just boring in life. Nothing ever changes. And like everything will change dramatically and people will say nothing ever changes right, right after it happens. And it's just, uh, it's it's funny. Like we have to see the humor in it. I think in order to like have a good time messing around and screwing around. Like there's a comedy to the like there's a futility to it. There's a paradox to it. And um, I, I I wonder if we can try and recruit some of the, you know, like a I think an idea I got a bit of mileage out of in the realm of like critics and naysayers is that they are part of the theater production. Like they provide the, so just as like the counterculture resists against the monoculture, like w when somebody's trying to get something done, like the naysayers going, nah, -uh, like they're, they're providing like background music, you know, <laughs> like providing the orchestration to the cinematic score to your accomplishment. Like, so, um, uh, <laughs> that's one way of looking at it. But yeah, you know, um, pessimism is just, it's, uh, it's, it's so, it's, I don't, I don't want to say it's misplaced. Like, again, I, I get, I get the emotional, um, valence to it. Like, it's, there's grief, there's grief in it, there's heartbreak in it, there's, uh, fear, right? One of the strongest, oldest emotions. But, um, it's, it's, you know, I, I think it's, again, so like you're saying stasis is a kind of death, right? So pessimism is a kind of death. It's a kind of, let's not change things, let's not try new things, let's just, hold what we have and die right keep like, like we don't want to lose more but everything's changing so we have to it's, it's really um i i get that it's difficult for some people but like probably for most people right and i i hope that we can do better to kind of initiate more people into the crucible of change so that they can experience some change in some domains and be like oh it feels it actually feels good to change some things and improve in some dimensions and see that i can still be me and I can still have meaning in my life and all of those things while chaos is happening around me because I know my values, I know my priorities, I know my friends and, and all of those things. And then I think when, when those things happen, like I, I expect we will see... No, I mean, no. I, I intend to, you know, encourage more people to... 
No, as I'm saying this, I'm like the phrasing is always a bit off. Like I was gonna, I was gonna say I want to encourage more people to be optimistic, but it's not like I want to change. Pe- like optimism just it just works. Uh, it, it just it's just it, it. We we look around you wherever you are in civilized life. Look around you and you see the love projects of optimists. I have this bottle of isopropyl alcohol disinfectant spray. It's the most boring thing in some dimension. Who who made this? Like who made the nozzle, right? Who made this liquid that can kill viruses? It's it's it took probably hundreds of you know who made the system that delivered this to my house. Like it's just it's magic. It's made up of like everywhere around us is just optimist who made a computer mouse is ah man it's it's we we live it's like we're walking on just this this uh huh, really really it's like imagine we are in a field of leaves like like a in a fall center, i'm thinking central park like leaves everywhere and then you're stepping on them and every leaf that you step on is just pure magic and then you're like you know, there's 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 no, there's no leaves around here. You know, leaves are real. <laughs> it's something like that. It's, I, I'm not doing it justice, but there, there, there's something to workshop there of like how it's like we're walking on air, pretending that magic isn't real, right? Which is like every everything that we do in our daily life is so magical, and we don't see it. It's, uh, it's bonkers. And and uh, I I love that metaphor because. That's another exercise I do a lot. Uh, so it, it, and and it's an exercise of look at something like you're seeing it for the first time. And then your mind will be literally blown throughout the day. It's like, holy shit. I, I, I can, I can, uh, all of the things that I can do in this little device, I'm holding up an iPhone here for yeah. people who are just listening. And, and like, the wonder of that, right? And and we it's funny because we immediately, not immediately, but we do adopt. And then we forget how, as you point out, how magical so much of the modern world actually is, right? Yeah. And and it's so easy to wah, 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 you know, bad off. But you know what? I agree with the point you were making a moment ago. Those voices are actually necessary, right? Yeah. Because, because like literally they might point out something really interesting that we optimists hadn't thought about. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's like, huh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting idea to workshop. They're probably right. Like, yeah. like thinking about the, I'm, so it's not like I am, I am, you know, uh, Panglossian and we live in the best of all perfect worlds, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but it, it, we we are striving to move always, right? Yeah. If we did live in the best possible world, I think we'd, be, we'd both we'd, we'd all chill out more. Like we just yeah. we just kind of <laughs> yeah. this very di- di- Dionysian kind of drink wine, you know, just relax. Everything's great. Everything's done. But like, no, and, the reason we're so hyped is that possibility is everywhere but we have to manifest it and we have to make it work and it cannot work it can it can go wrong right so we gotta do stuff totally right i gave uh a salon for anna gat uh Mm -hmm. at intellect and in fact i opened with the wright brothers and i'm like what i'm interested in is so their their flight lasted a few seconds they only went a hundred odd feet but they fucking got off the ground and and so I always put myself in like, what if I was there that day, right? What if I was watching this? Because apparently a lot of people were like, eh, no big deal. Took you a long look, time for the newspapers to cover it. You can look this up. There's a YouTube recording. No, so there's, there's, there's a video on YouTube and this itself is magical, right? There was someone who was there who was interviewed about 60, 70 years ago. So, when he, so he was a young man then. He's an old man in the interview from about 60, 70 years ago-ish. And that video's on YouTube. And you can go look, look, look it up. Like guy who was at the right... I, I can try oh, and find it for you and send it to you. I, uh, and, and, and he was saying that uh, like people, even being present, like he didn't quite believe it, I think. Like it didn't seem real. Like is it a trick? Is it a something? And like, like he's very proud to have witnessed that bit of history. And again, like we get to hear this firsthand testimony like on our phones or on whatever. Like, oh my God. 
And that's so magic, magical. right? Yeah, and and the way the the way that I was using the metaphor for the salon was basically, you know, of the two or the two dominant types of people there, I I I'm interested in the one who was like I just witnessed a miracle. And my possibility space just opened up ridiculously, right? Because like all of the old myths were about, you know, don't fly too close to the sun. You know, all all of, as you say, we use our creativity to suppress creativity in others. <laughs> and yeah. and th- that leads to the precautionary principle and everything else. Well, I'm, I'm looking at my clock here and you've already warned me that you only had a certain amount of time. We got to, we got to, we, 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 yeah, we, because we, we got to actually plan our, our second one because there's just so many ideas that we just left on the table here. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, like, like the idea though, that I, I wanted to also follow up on with you because you're particularly good at it is the, the, I have an, an another guy I love uh, who's been a guest on the show a couple of times, and and he the idea of possibility space he changes his name's George Mack, and what he does oh, is yeah. he, 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 so so he changes it to the luck surface, right? Oh yeah, and, expanded luck surface. Yeah, and and they're basically the same thing, right? Like Correct. the the if you're looking at possibility space, that's really a way to get lucky more, right? And the way you get lucky more is open your aperture, right? Mm. You can't, like, yes, do do sometimes, if we're focusing on something very specific and very technical and everything else, then of course, then you want to limit your your focus on that particular thing. But Mm -hmm. in general, in general, as you're developing thoughts, having an open aperture, you're going to see more. One of my favorite stories is that this is how stainless steel was invented. So there was a guy in during like World War One in Britain. His job was to come up with this experiment with gun barrels to try and make better gun barrels. And so he was just try different alloys and stuff. And he accidentally, you know, semi like tangentially alloyed steel with chromium. And it's like, oh, why is this so shiny? And he could have gone, that's not relevant to my job. But he was like, this, that's fucking interesting, you know. And uh, stainless steel. Uh, and like, yeah, I mean, so people need to have that, hmm, you know, the, the interesting thing for a scientist is to say, that's interesting, that's strange, hmm, what's going on here, right? Like, that, and say, you know, famously uh, penicillin, right? Like all this, so much things is just noticing, yeah, never be so attached to the thing that you're doing that you completely whiff when something like 10 times a thousand like so saying a thousand sounds dramatic but it's happened before where you're trying to achieve a you know a nice pleasant outcome and you accidentally might stumble onto something a thousand times more powerful and then you got to be kind of chill about it and be like oh you know just another day at the office i just you know um i always think about how when i describe what alexander fleming did i say he punched pestilence in the dick for all mankind we used to have four <laughs> we used yeah. to have the four the four horsemen of like Plague, pestilence, uh, poverty. I can't remember the specific. Like, I can't, one of it was pestilence, and he did it. Like, and when he presented his findings to to like his esteemed colleagues and asked them if there are any questions, they're like, "No, I, uh, it looks good, I guess." Like, they did not have in their model of what was possible in science in medicine that oh, we could just remove infections entirely. Like, so they they did not. It, it just seems so like like what you're saying about like Icarus and flight and like. It's just it just didn't seem possible to like completely do that, and so when presented with it, they're like, it "Doesn't look like anything to me." Like seems seems good, I guess. And it takes years for people to see the applications, and then like, you know, when they're trying to fund um the like commercial application for like antibiotics, like it was a struggle to fundraise for ending <laughs> illness of a kind, a certain kind for for mankind. And again, that like that's why we don't. Oh, we live in the best world. That's great. Like no, like somewhere around us, someone has just solved an incredible problem, and no one around them is seeing it. And we're like, I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> we have to, we have to teach everyone to pay attention so that they can notice when their neighbor solves a huge problem and like doesn't realize that they've done it. Right, exactly. Is, oh, 
And and again, human OS is such that you know it's it it's probably a feature and not a bug. That attitude, right? Like I, I'm reminded of the story about during the Middle Ages uh, when they when they first started uh, dissecting cadavers, right? Um, the mm. the the auditoriums were set up such that they people sitting around were would were in an elevation, right? And then the person doing the dissecting was here in the center of the theater. And what's really interesting in this story is the body is right in front of them, right? Right. But but they are reciting what Galen said mm, about mm. the internal part of a medicine uh, of a body, which was wrong. Right. And they're reciting it from memory while looking at the body they're dissecting, and they yeah. literally can't see it. Yeah. Yeah. Set set back neuroscience by like century almost, right? They're looking Centuries. for the census. Yeah. It's Galen, Aristotle, and all, and it's like yeah, it's like it's just a bunch of guys. There's another great yeah. Emerson quote, is something like, um, you know, people say to like young men in libraries worship, you know, the writings of Cicero and Locke and so and so, forgetting that those guys were young men in libraries when they wrote their books, right? And so it's just yeah. that that privileging. It's not. It's not like get a lot of me. I know what's best for everyone, but like it's like you know, you are a, a co-creator, right? Of of whatever it is that you're experiencing, and like. Your perceptions are valid, and you know your you, which is scary, I guess, in some ways. But like, it's exciting, like, cause your life matters so much. Oh my god, <laughs> right? like every like just looking around and seeing what's going on and and noticing, it's so crazy to me that like value can be created just by noticing things. Like it's just like I I used when I was a kid, I used to think I want to work in like science and technology, and then along the way, I I was like based on my reading and stuff and so part of it is I encountered like hardcore technologists and like and I met engineer mindset people and I'm like they have a they have a tinkering with their hands that I don't quite have and I can't compete on that front but also like again with like the Wright Brothers flight for example like Morgan Housel talks about this about uh, how uh, after the flight was made it was several years before the information spread and I'm like okay so you make flight happen and then it takes several years for that ideas to spread and if you spread the ideas faster, it's functionally the same as if you had invented the technology sooner, right? You, you get what I'm saying? Like from the end user's perspective, it doesn't matter how fast it takes. You know, it doesn't matter who you do. The consumer doesn't really think about diff attributing what different parts of the ecosystem contributed what to getting the thing to, to the door, right? And so, like, if you recommended a great book to me, you are as responsible for me reading that book as the author of the book. And so it's like making good recommendations can be as fulfilling as writing good books. And like similarly, like, you know, um, yeah, just, just observing what's going on in the world and noticing good things happening and sharing that information. Like from some people, some, some people are dismissive of this as like, oh, it's just talking shop or it's just whatever. But like, oh my God, it's the best possible like if again, like if we lived in a world where information was being perfectly distributed all the time, then again, like I would do something else. But the idea that this is a bottleneck drives me insane. Like that, that there exists. Like so many people right now have problems that already have solutions, and they just don't have a connection to the solution. And like, why? <laughs> you know, it's a, you know, it's that, that. I think that's a, another example. Like anyone, any case study we discuss, we can find that the fact that a solution exists or could exist is a sign that. We live in a very possible, possibility bubbling world. But the fact that it hasn't happened yet means that, you know, we got work to do. Exactly. <sighs> and, and the, you know, like the other example, a great example of that is Semmelweis with hand washing, remember? Yeah, poor, poor and, and like the you know, poor guy ends up uh, dying in, in, in an asylum. It, well, well. If if people had noticed and put their social biases to the side, right? Like the story is just mind boggling. He's like, all of these women are dying after being attended by the male physicians. Well, maybe that's because they're going from dissecting cadavers to giving, uh, helping the woman give birth without washing their hands. And so he made them wash their hands, but it was the social convention of the era. That was unmanly right. to wash your hands. And so 
I always use that as a great example of the data is right in front of you and you totally ignore it. Yeah. And 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 that's what happened with Semmelweis. But on the upside, the the time for data to get out into the wild, so to speak, has compressed dramatically. Yeah. And so because of this interconnected world in which we live, because you and I can talk to each other in real time right now, even though you're in Singapore and I'm in Connecticut. Across the planet. Yeah. It's amazing. And and yeah. so like that's why I am so shocked about the world in which we're going into. It's just Same. like amazing. What an amazing time to be alive. Yeah. All right, my friend. You get to be emperor again here. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna let you uh incept the world's population. We're giving you the magic mic. And you're going to oh, right. say two things into the magic microphone. And whenever the world's population tomorrow is, they're going to wake up and they're going to think to themselves, I have just had two of the greatest ideas. And what I'm going to do that's different from all the other times is I'm going to act on each of these two ideas. What are you going to incept into the world's population? All right. So, okay. Uh, here's how I'm going to think about it. Uh, so I have I have my Domino's meme, which is like my vision yeah. for how things get better. I love better. that one. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the, fir the first Domino is love plus curiosity. And so I'm going to pick one thing that is like love related and one thing that's like curiosity related. Uh, so with regards to love, I think I'm going to talk about kinship. And so, okay, here, here's, here's one. Um, everybody already knows people. Right, like you already have friends, you have like childhood friends, you have um, you know, people that you've known. Like you can you can go and scroll through your phone contact list or scroll through your Facebook list and see how you feel about each person at a, at a at a glance, like, oh I like that guy, oh that guy's weird, oh you know, whatever. So like I would say scroll through your phone, find the person that evokes in you the most like excitement or like fond feeling or like ah oh, this person's great. I haven't talked to them in years. And talk to them. You know, it's, it's just like people don't do that. You can do that at any point in time. And like, if you ask people, when was the last time you went through your list and found someone you admire and talk to them? And they're always like, oh, you know, they're great, but I don't want to like waste their time. I don't want to make them feel like, no, like, okay, do a little bit. So, okay, if they're a busy, famous, important person or something, like, do a little bit of prep. Like, figure out what they would be interested in hearing and like send them a thing and say, oh, I thought about, like, you know, maybe they're working on some project and you're like, hey, I saw this thing and I thought of you, how's, how's that? You know what I mean? Like be thoughtful about it and then just have an open-ended conversation about whatever you can. And so that's that's like step one. And that's a step. Step two is like do that for multiple people. And then three is introduce them to each other if you can, like have a dinner party and have all of them. And if if, if like, some small percentage of people do that in the world, like this, that achieves a whole lot of outcomes. So that's what, right? So like, um, let's call that social game, right? Or like, like connecting people. The other thing would be curiosity. And uh, let me think about what feels right for me with this. Uh, right, okay. Um, so I wrote a whole book called Introspect and then when I tried to condense it and rewrite it and whatever uh, I think one of the most interesting things that came up for me is just the sense of if you were formulating your problems correctly you would not feel like they were problems and I, I mean it's problems with a capital P right so like you know like if you got to get the groceries it's a task you have to do it's not a problem like you have to, oh my god i have a problem of groceries like maybe, maybe if you're like if you have no money in the bank you're like okay i have a problem of how am i going to get the groceries i got to figure out how i'm going to get the money blah 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 but okay so if if you have a problem um and it it feels like a problem it's probably because so un unless you have like a so okay in some in some cases it's because you lack some resource or you lack some and you may need to figure out how to get that resource right but generally speaking, the problems that people get stuck with are misframed or like, you know, so like we avoid the problems we know how to avoid. We solve the problems we know how to solve. And so we are left with the problems we could not avoid and could not solve. And the reason we could not avoid them or could not solve them, and this is actually kind of dodgy now that I think about it, is like, like, like David talks about stuff like this. Like, it's because our current way of thinking is poorly fit 
to the problem. So it's like we are we are misdiagnosing the problem in some way. But we don't feel, we don't wake up in the morning thinking, I feel like I've misdiagnosed all my problems today. Like <laughs> you wake up feeling like, I know what my problems are, right? And so there's a, I think a Bernard Shaw quote maybe, or Emerson thinks Bernard Shaw, like the problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And like right. the problem, the problem with problems is the illusion that we know what our problems are. Like we're framing our problems wrongly. And like I, I'm, I'm surely doing this at the same time as well. Like even in conversation with you, I realized I'm always carrying in my mind. Oh, I have all these essays that I need to write. What if that's not my problem? What if my problem is I need to have conversations with people about these ideas? And I'm like, oh, it's gonna wait until I'm done with the essays. But like I spent two years and it's not. I'm making some progress, but it's really slow. So maybe I shouldn't be thinking. I have an essay problem. Maybe it's I have an idea communication problem, an idea sharing problem, you know? And so, yeah, so all of that is to say, um, consider the possibility that your current description of your problems is misdiagnosed. And so even, even simpler than that would be, describe your problems, bro, <laughs> right? So I, I have, I have an I essay, essay idea, which is like, just describe things, bro, where... People get so hung up on trying to convey some grand idea or trying to convey something important and then they get all, get all twisted in knots. And it turns out you can't help but share your understandings and your ideas and your perspectives of things just in the process of trying to describe something. So you just try to describe a day in your life or you try to describe, you know, like, so I, I just casually happened to mention Taylor Swift at some point. I'm not like a huge fan or anything, but like I went to see a concert. If I wrote you, so if, if Jim, you said, Visa, write me a thousand, thousand words about what it was like to watch Taylor Swift. So in that essay, writing out, so I went to see Taylor Swift, the concert was like this, blah, blah, blah. As I start writing, along the way, I will accidentally reveal things about myself to you, about like what I'm thinking about. You know, I'll, I'll, I might say things like, huh, her relationship with her audience is so and so, and like her, the way she approaches this is like that. And it turns out like you, you can't help, but when talking about something, you can't help but talk about everything else, right? And so this is, this is and this is the essence of, introspection in my opinion so it's like I, I when people think that introspection should be oh i should talk about my feelings like yes yeah, kind of true but you can't help but have your feelings contaminate or like influence everything that you do so you might as well just do something sometimes it can be helpful to do something kind of random ish or something seemingly superfluous so that you don't feel like this burdened with this has to be good this has to be important this has to be whatever and then you accidentally do something good maybe like if you can see it so, uh, so the first thing was social game. Find the best people that you know and talk to them. Uh, you already and pe- these are people you already know, right? So, like, find the best person you already know and talk to them. And uh, for the curiosity thing, is about like consider a different interpretation of your problem. So even this, okay. So write down for fun, like in a silly sing songy voice. What are my problems today? Oh, I have a problem with my wife. I have a problem with my son. I have a problem with my boss. I have a problem, like in a, in a jokey, silly way so you don't feel like it has to be serious. And then once you come up with those problems, try experimenting with an alternate frame, an alternate description, which can also be silly. So you can say something fake even, right? Like, so my problem with my wife is that she's too sexy. Also, uh, okay, maybe it doesn't feel too great. My problem with my wife is that um, we don't uh, talk enough or we, we don't, it's, it's like improv rules, right? You try and find something that doesn't feel great too. What, what would feel funny? The, how, let me try and make it funny, right? The problem with my wife is uh, she's too obsessed with me. No, my problem with my wife is um, she... She works too hard. No, she's you know you, you keep you keep riffing. The problem with my wife is, um, she solves all our problems too well. And then I'm like, hmm, that's that's <laughs> she's too good. She's too good at solving our problem. Like and then so like you know and, and you laughed right. So like uh, David Ogilvy has a quote which is like, make your thinking as funny as possible because the best ideas come as jokes. And like yeah, you see the first. You, you, you just witnessed this. The first seven or six ideas were like, eh, okay, whatever. But when you get to, oh, my problem with my wife is she's too good at solving problems. I'm so fucked. And you're, like, you're like, what do you mean? <laughs> how, how is that a problem? And I'm like, I'll tell you. And then you, you start going there, right? And, and I love that I just got to go through like seven bad ideas to get the good one, right? So you have to persist and you have to keep experimenting until you have the feeling. And if you do it with someone, so in step one, meet someone, and step two, try this thing, and you can do it in their presence. So if if the person you admire is laughing, oh my God, you're doing great. Like they're gonna spot something fantastic, right? Um, yeah, and so even if it's not quite true, exploring that idea space will get you somewhere interesting. And it will that's how you get the 
sparking a connection, trying something different or weird or new, and then you reframe your, you reconceptualize your problem. And then it, it, you always find, I think, that with these big capital P problems, the way that the problem goes away is never what you initially thought it was going to be, right? Because if it was, you have done it already, right? It's, it's something strange. It's like, you know, um, often I hear from people who like quit smoking or drinking or something. It's like, you don't do it by trying to do it. It's like, oh, I picked up weightlifting and it was, I really liked it. And I realized that cigarettes were like affecting my gains. So I wanted more gains. And so I stopped smoking. Like it's, it, it's like that. Like you, you, some, some strange reorganization of the problem is what makes the problem redundant rather than like, whereas if you're trying too hard to be like, oh, I didn't smoke today. Oh, I didn't smoke today. Like every day, cigarettes are still on your mind. Like you're a smoker with zero cigarettes smoked. So you have to reconceptualize the problem entirely and like rechange your relationship with things. Yeah, very long-winded. <laughs> very, very long-winded. But yeah, so the first, so to compress, first thing is talk to the best people you know. And two is like riff on your problems playfully until you find something fun and experiment with that. Ah, a, yes. a tour de force, Riza. A tour <laughs> de force. I love talking to you. Thank you so, so much. We, we will set up the next time and we will continue to riff. It's great to see you and thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. This was great for me as well. I feel like I have several... I, I got to listen to this after it's done so that I can... Huh, did I say that? Oh, shit. That's interesting. You know, like... <laughs> I think especially I in conversation, it. especially in conversation with someone else that you you vibe with, uh, it's not even you anymore. It's like you're co-creating it, right? So it's like you're yeah. so in sympathetic with the interestingness that you forget to suppress yourself, right? So again, like usually our creativity is used to suppress our creativity, but and you know people don't. That sounds weird when you say it that way. But when you say it as oh, we use creativity to suppress. Um, weirdness. We use it to suppress awkwardness. We use it to suppress like all of the bad outcomes associated with creativity, right? So it's doing that that suppresses the creativity. So in a good conversation when you're vibing, like you forget to get in your own way and then like you just spit good shit all the time. And then totally. you're like, oh shit. Yeah. And that's how that's how it. we that's how we do what we want to do. We just we just have to do, have this thing that we just had. We just need to scale it to several billion people. Then maybe even like half a less than half a billion, and like the rest will pick it up from osmosis. Exactly. Uh, uh, all right, man. Great to see right. you, and right. hope to see you soon. All right, take care.